The story of the Whitestown Fire Department actually begins before the department itself. In the late 1800s, towns began sprouting up along the eventual railroad lines across the New Prairie. Whitestown would become a stop on the Big Four line from Cincinnati to St. Louis. Named for the railroad's president, Albert S. White, Whitestown was a legitimate boomtown. Growing rapidly with the rail traffic and shortly thereafter, a traction line from Indianapolis. In 1887, it was published that this bustling town was home to two churches, four grocery stores, three clothing stores, a druggist, a miller, a hotel, two doctors, one lawyer, and three boarding homes. Industrially, the town had a stave mill, two grist mills, two tile factories, a brickyard, a grain elevator, and several individual blacksmiths and carpenters. And what we often brag about in the growth of this town today is, in fact, a second act almost a century later. But this boomtown had its troubles too. With two gambling halls, two saloons, a dance hall, and one house of ill repute, trouble was always waiting in the wings. One of the earliest printed news stories reflecting this was when some fellows from Royalton caused trouble with a shoot-up at the Monte Carlo Roadhouse in 1904. Add to this many reports of arson, including this tiny ominous report buried in the Indianapolis Star in 1896. An attempt was made this past week to burn the village of Whitestown, fires being started in several places. Around the turn of the century, there were several published stories of fires in the town of a suspicious nature, often noted as incendiary. These fires were always fought locally with bucket brigades being filled from local water wells. Among these stories, a few stand out. In July of 1915, several papers reported on the spectacular midnight fire at the Jenkins and Cohe grain elevator. The fire exhausted all of the wells in town and a request for help was sent to the Indianapolis Fire Department. However, by 3 a.m. the fire had burned itself to a point of control. As told by resident Glenn Hauser, the fire burned bright all night and was said to have been seen for miles. It was several days before it went out. But the turning point and the catalyst for the fire department as we know it today was the massive fire of April 2, 1929. This fire was widely reported and cost the town a lodge, Heinz Hardware Store, and the bank. Both the Indianapolis and Lebanon fire departments responded to the fire, which eventually cost over $40,000 in damages. On April 3rd, the Indianapolis Star ran a tiny column that highlighted the lack of fire protection in both Whitestown and Brazil, Indiana, after recent large fires. It's possible that this prompted the trustee, Samuel West, to make a change. Well, Samuel West and a handful of volunteers made that change, and while little is known for certain, it is recorded that the Whitestown Fire Department began in May of 1929. It was called the Worth Township Fire Department at the time. Still a bucket brigade, the organized department consisted of foundation members, Er Allen, Grover Allen, Minnie Sorter, Albert Hine, Horace Wheat, and Clyde Loftner. One year later, the first fire truck was purchased for the department, a 1930 Chevrolet Hal Pumper. This truck was housed in Grover Allen's garage, originally located on Main Street, but then moved to Pierce Street in what would eventually become the Belmar Building, which still stands today. In 1934, another massive fire swept the town, destroying the Heinz Hardware Store, once again, and the Allen Grocery Store, among other things. The fire was almost contained when the wells were pumped dry. The 1930 Howe was a good pumper for a while, but then became plagued with troubles. Whitestown author Toby McDaniel tells of the day that Jack Tucker Pipe's house caught on fire. The Pipe's house was right next to the school and just around the corner from the Allen's garage where the truck was stored. Being stored in the back of a mechanic's garage, the first step to responding the truck was to move the other vehicles out of the way. Once that was accomplished, the truck could be started and respond, if it had gas, which on more than one occasion, it did not. On this fateful day in 1946, it also had a dead battery and had been pushed to the corner gas station. McDaniel reports that the trucks could be seen from the school sitting at the pumps with several men working feverishly to get it started. By then, trucks from Lebanon and Zionsville had arrived, but the house was already lost. The very next day, an article ran in the Muncie Evening Press, Whitestown firemen wished they had horses. The trustee at the time, Adelbert Neese, decided a change was again needed, and the first official firehouse was built. A small block two-bay garage was built on the only property that the township owned, right next to the schoolhouse in the summer of 1946. Albert Hine, one of the founding members of the department, and a janitor at the school maintained the truck and the station. Again, McDaniel writes of how Hine wouldn't let the students touch the old 1930 for fear that it wouldn't start if needed. Two new trucks were purchased soon after. 
1947 Howe Pumper, and a 1948 Howe Tanker. These trucks would serve the department well into the 1960s. The last living member of the original fire department was photographed at an open house in 1980. H.O. Horace Wheat was well known among the town and the firemen, but passed away in 1985 at the age of 89. This left a gap in the history of our department, but as a senior in high school in 1953, John Hancock was only a few years removed from the foundation when he became a fireman and would eventually become the chief of the department for many years. Well, from here, we'll let those that live the history tell the history. <laughs> Junior or senior in high school, before it was in October, November, something might have been December, the fire siren was right outside of the high school, and the principal was on the uh, department. That siren rang forever, and he finally, it was between classes, and he finally said, John, Fluff, come with me. We went to Harry Edder's farm, which is west of town on County Road 500, cornfield fire. Mounted picker, instead of driving along the side of it, he drove through the, the standing corn. Uh, we got there in our 47 Chevy Pumper. He'd drive away, stop, put it in gear, and we could hose it down, stop, drive a little bit farther. But that started my career in 1953. Mm -hmm. And I stayed with it for 35, 36 years. Now, I can't tell you exactly 86, 87 when I finally left the department. There that building. And it started out, the first time I remember, the truck was in where Belmar was at. And that's where, <laughs> oh God. They tried to start that truck one time, it was in there, and they got it out and they pulled it and did everything, trying to get it started and it wouldn't start, and they finally checked the gas tank and it was empty. <laughs> uh, the pumper was a 47 and the tanker was a 46. And it was funny, they built that new fire station next to the school. They tried to back them into the building and they wouldn't go in. The overhead doors, the hardware on the doors were sticking inside and the trucks wouldn't go in. The doors and putting different hardware, different doors on to get the two trucks in. No kidding. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the 47 uh, pumper we had, you had to stop put it in gear, and then you could run the uh, the uh, pump. You couldn't, didn't have pump and roll. Sure. Okay. And we sit on the top of it, uh, Fluff Allen's, uh, the cornfield, and we'd tap on the hood, or the top of the truck, and then he'd pull on up. Mm -hmm. But it was noisy, and we couldn't talk to him, so our tapping on the, <laughs> the cab of the truck. He knew to pull up because we had the fire put out. But yeah, that that tanker we was in the cornfield, that eighty acre cornfield. And we were going through there and the wind changed and brought that back over that truck. We were setting up on top of it, hosing the field down. When it, it came back over us, there's four of us sitting in the cab of that truck, and the fire went over us. We got out and put the fire, <laughs> the flame down on the truck. Yeah. yeah. Some of those things like that I remember because four people in the cab of that damned old truck. Yeah. It was crowded.
introduce yourself, Greg. Well, I'm, I'm Greg Bedell, and um, I, I don't have all the old stories like some of these guys do because I didn't grow up here as a kid. Uh, my, my first recollection, recollection of Whitestown was uh, probably about 71. I was 15 years old. Uh, maybe it was maybe I was 14 years old but my mom you remember this John my mom was a first aid instructor and a CPR instructor my mom was a charter member of the Zionsville ambulance and my dad was a fireman on the Zionsville fire department and my mom had been asked to come up here and give a CPR class to the work to the Worth Township Whitestown fire department so my mom asked me to come along to help which I did a lot of times help her carry the the dummies in you know Annie and, and all that stuff in and so that's the very first time I ever rolled into the town of Whitestown was to help my mom give a CPR class to this old guy uh, which he wasn't as old then and Don Melvin and George Fry and uh, uh, some of the other guys I can't remember Essex was probably there and uh, um, uh, who was the trustee the big truck guy was a big it was trustee at the Gene time Baker. Gene, Baker. Gene Baker yeah there was uh, but that's what I did I that was the very first time uh, that I ever was in Whitestown had any recollection of Whitestown um, and so it's funny that as as I grew up and I got old you know older I ended up buying a house and by that time I had taken and become a CPR instructor myself a Red Cross first aid, uh, for, uh, advanced first aid instructor, and I was an EMT. And Kurt Davis was a kid that I grew up with in Zionsville who lived up north of town. He saw me, he says, hey, what are you doing? I, you know, he said, you knew I was an EMT. And he says, Greg, you need to join the fire department. We need a guy like you on the fire department. So I said, well, I never thought about it, but I might as well. Mom and Dad did all that stuff, you know, so I might as well do it too, you know. So I did. Uh, I came in, and I was the first EMT uh, on the fire department of uh, the Worth Township Fire Department. What year was that? It would have been in 80. Right, I think it was 1980. Wow. Um, but the fire department was my, was, was my uh, pride and joy. I loved the fire department. Um, John had, uh, because I was an EMT, he eventually, uh, he decided that uh, we needed to have uh, a presence in the EMS a group and uh, I had been going to in-service training at Witham Hospital and they'd been all over me about getting a first responder program going down here so I talked with John and we would sit back and we worked it out and we finally figured out what Rob Guest and I we took and put together a fundraising thing and we raised money to, to buy our very first first aid kits and stuff and um, I remember the very first run we had was uh, Brian and Gary Mills's dad he had had a heart attack in the shower. He died in the shower. I had to grab, I had to grab all the first aid kit stuff off the floor of my living room because I had yet inventoried it and put it on the station. So I'm grabbing it all, put it in my car and to run it out there. Uh, but that was, uh, that was the very first uh, first responder run that we had. Um, and uh, Rob Guest and I, we worked real hard to take and get that going. And uh, we did get it going. You know, one of the former chiefs, um, Scott Cochran, and he had ALS, or a lot of people don't know what that is, Lou Gehrig's, they, are, they know Lou Gehrig's, and he wanted to ride in that truck, you know, there's a new one, and they picked him up, carried him, set him in it, he got to ride. 41 years old. Somebody's up there, and that was me sitting up there. And so I eventually got in there. Well, the guy that was helping me on the uh, on the ladder behind me, backing me up, he never got off the ladder. He didn't want to climb up the icy roof. He was afraid to climb up the icy roof. So I climbed in the room, and I'm in there trying to fight this thing. And I had another flash over between that, you know. And little did I know, Scott Cochran, the chief recognized that I was in that building by myself he climbed up the ladder over the top of the other guy and this is the Scott Cochran that you guys need to know about he climbed up over the top of that guy climbed up and came into the window and said Greg what can I do to help you I said I don't know why don't you take the hose I'm tired and so we went we went and he did some we put the fire out and then my bell went off and had to come in but um, Scott Cochran was uh, was an amazing guy he uh, 
He didn't know when to quit. He was the guy that would, um, he, would, he, he, could climb, he would climb a tree and take raccoons out of the raccoon's nest when he was a kid. He was a guy that didn't have any fear of anything. Best guy in the world. Died too early. I mean, he was a, uh, he was he was the guy that changed the fire department over to a new thinking, I believe. I, I don't believe I know. But Scott Cochran was uh like I said, best man he was a hell of a firefighter. I know that. Me and him we went in it was on fifty south in between eight hundred and nine hundred. Well one of them it's burning, I mean it's there's fire coming through the roof. We all pull up everybody. So me and Cocker, we pack up, get the hose leg. We go in the front door and the fire's all in the back. So, but the ceiling had come down and it was like it had that heat. I don't know if it was the wire from the ducts or what, but it was that, uh, that little thin wire, you know, that, and you couldn't break. I mean, yep. you just, all you do is get tangled up in it and you're sitting there going. So me and Cocker, we go in, and then we make a right, and then we come to all the fire. Well, all of a sudden, ammunition. This dude was a gun freak. He had full automatic weapons and like 3,000 rounds of, three to 4,000 rounds of ammunition in this place. And it started popping. So all of a sudden, I don't know, something flashed or something, gunpowder or what, but it, it wasn't a real big explosion, but it was just enough. But it made a big poof. And, and I, you know, you, the door was here, and I don't know what you had, a little six inches on each side of it, you know, kind of. Well, that fire started coming out. Well, I just kind of sidestepped it and went down. And that fire was all coming down. And Cocker, he's laying on the floor over here. Well, he looks up, and he thinks I'm standing in this fire. He says, he says all I can see fires from your waist up was nothing but fire. Well, he didn't realize that, you know, I was just sidestepping it. And it was all in front of me. I wasn't getting burned. Well, he reaches up and grabs me. Really? Because he got the line. He reaches up and grabs me by the nap of my neck in the pack there and jerks me down on the freaking ground. <laughs> the next thing I know, I'm on the ground. And I got an inch and three-quarter line just pouring on me. I mean, I'm laying, you know, sideways. And I can't, you know, I can't move. You know how it is. You're laying down. Somebody's got to, with that air back. You know, I'm like a freaking turtle. Well, Cochran has got a hold of me, and he's got a hold. Cochran was a strong man. He was in the rock business. So he, all he did was sling rocks. Uh, he, he did a lot for the fire service. Uh, he did, uh, he, he was a man full of integrity and character. He just had, he had it. He was, he was a guy that was, uh, and we, we really miss him. I mean, he was, uh, he was, uh, it was terrible what happened to him. Um, we were good friends. We did a lot together, and so uh, it was really devastating on all of us. And when we lost Scott, uh, so.
John Hall. Yeah, I can talk a lot about John Hall. Um, boy, you talk about a master of anything. He could, he, he was very, very humble, very do anything. You know, he was not the, he was not the leader guy, but he was, he was an outstanding guy to do anything for you that he wanted, that you needed to have done. Um, he took in, um, like, he would make hose clamps, you know, he actually shut off hoses in the middle, of, you know, he, he, he built those. We didn't have to buy them, he built them. Um, he took and like, he built, built the things for the, uh, for the air packs. He built, uh, he, he built that old uh, Dodge, uh, we had an old uh, power wagon, Dodge power wagon, three quarter ton Dodge power wagon. He built a thing on the front of that that we could stand on the front of and we could put out grass fires. Oh, he built a lot. Hose clamps, uh, built both kinds of, what's, he, he built the screw type, you know, where you could screw down, or he built the lever where you had to lock, you know, overcome the lock. See, he would work on trucks. He would, John Hall was, uh, he was a good man. And like I said, he could build, he could fix anything, build anything. And I would hate to see the stuff that he built for that fire station, the money that he saved back in them days. Uh, December the 23rd, 1986. It was one of the worst days. God. I was at work, the Speedway, and they said, come home. I think Greg was there, Rob Guest. And they set us down at the table in the, uh, in front of the station and told us about John had went into work that morning and he did a lot of things for the department and he'd been shot and killed in Lebanon and uh, that was a terrible day. But John was just the nicest guy. He lived not just a block or two away from me there on the west side of town uh, and that was just unfortunate. We took and uh, that's where, did you guys still have the, the, the John Hall Award? Now, we created that on, on his behalf and we created it uh, for a specific event that happened. Um, two guys uh, lived next door to each other. Uh, a, a storm came into town, a lightning storm came into town, and it struck the cable, the, the, the cable that went into Elma Sorter's old house. And at the time, the two guys who were neighbors, they didn't get along. They didn't get along. But those two guys, in the early morning, they got together and they went across the street and they basically almost bucket brigaded the thing to put the fire out and work together to take care of that. And it was because of their bravery and their ability to get along together, we created that award. Um, George Fry, I not heard anybody talk about George Fry, so I want to talk a little bit about George Fry. Uh, George Fry was an ex-Marine, uh, quite the stature of a man. Uh, you, would, uh, you always knew when you was addressed by George Fry. And um, I, I will never forget one of the most favorite sayings that he would always say, especially if you would, uh, if you would get cocky with a guy and he says, yeah, you know, that's your, mouth, that's your ass talking because your mouth knows better. That was one of his favorite sayings. And then the other favorite saying was, you know, he just wants you to go over there and practice falling down. I'll be over there in just a minute and we'll take care of this. That was a two of his, those are two of his favorite sayings. And he would just, um, but he was a force to be reckoned with. Uh, but he was, he was a firefighter that uh, from a Marine Corps standard, he was, uh, he was the guy. He taught me a lot about it. And uh, my dad, like I said, we lived two blocks from the fire station. I got a good one right here. We had an Irish setter dog. Her name was Ginger, Red, we called her Red. And that dog would follow my dad everywhere. My dad, we, back then we had fire phones. Your phone would, your phone would just ring constant. Mm -hmm. Like I said, my dad, he just throw slippers on and run across the yard and around the building and hell you're uptown. Well, that, my, our Ari Setter would follow him up, and you know, they left the doors open to the barn and all that. She would go in there and grab one of his shoes and take it back home 
and put it on the porch. <laughs> so here's my dad that's cussing like a trooper on when they get back, get back. He's only got one shoe there, and he's hollering at me. Get fire was, but he had a pair of nice shoes on, which my dad when he was a, he was a kind of a slick slick dresser. I mean, from the he learned that from the Marine Corps, and his shoes was always spit shined. Which he said he set them shoes up on top of the end, uh, up what they call a pumper back then, you know. And he set that back on the hose rack. He said he his shoes. And he said, and two days later, when he finally went to grab his shoes, there they are, full of water. Oh, really? <laughs> and they were some patent leather, nice damn shoes, you know. And I can remember him cussing about that, <laughs> telling that story. But that was a big fire.